Psychologist therapist of Reddit, what are some bad pieces of mental health advice you've seen on social media? You are wasting one stroke 3rd of your life sleeping not just bulls but a recipe for madness and death. Pretty sure I'm wasting two stroke 3rds of my life by staying awake. I saw someone tell another individual with schizophrenia that they didn't need medication. What they really needed is the motivation to cope with their mental illness symptoms. Motivation, yes. Comma in my day kid didn't have these so called mental health issues. Get over it. That's because in the good old days, affected persons fell through the cracks and committed suicide became homeless and vanished, or were locked up away from society until they died, so what you're seeing is survivorship bias. I had somebody in the Arnarcissistic Parents group privately message me after I posted about entering therapy because of my childhood, telling me the easiest way to deal with it was to forget about it and move on with my life. Comma easiest way to deal with it was to forget about it and move on with my life. If life was this easy, therapy wouldn't be a thing. What a crappy thing to say to someone. I have bipolar and some people that know ask if I've considered going for a no medication approach. Yeah, I tried. In that time I had more suicide attempts than I can count and I was extremely volatile and unstable. Medication has given me an actual opportunity to live and function like an adult. Do you know what it's like to not be suicidal or manic? It's really nice. I won't give this up for anything. This. You think I haven't also tried pulling up my bootstraps, eating well, exercising, sitting in the sun, etc. Meds get me to a place where I can actually exercise, eat well, etc etc etc. It is all important and works together but first your brain has to function enough to do all the rest. As both a psych nurse and a counselor, I see so many terrible things. Most of the advice you see online from non-scientific sources is mostly harmless pop psychology stuff, and some can actually be helpful. For example, don't use your phone in bed to help you sleep better at night, or daily meditation for mindfulness, etc. But there are things I see online all the time that are just such bulls I'm not even sure how they are legally allowed to stay up, such as almost anything to do with essential oils some essential oils in small amounts can be useful for mild aromatherapy in some conditions can help with seasonal affective disorder or as additives and medicinal mixes but otherwise there's basically no evidence that essential oils do anything other than cost a lot of money and destroy the environment some can be legit dangerous to your health People who claim there is any kind of trick that will snap you out of depression or addiction, or motivational speakers who claim that you just need to think positive. If some people find that helpful, that's great, but there is basically no evidence that self-help stuff is better than placebo when it comes to depression or other conditions. Anyone who tells you that you just need to get over it is full of crap and doesn't actually understand what it means to process something difficult. But the big one for me is when people claim that emotions are somehow illogical, and that acting like an emotionless logic machine is the best way to be. Emotions are generally perfectly reasonable responses to thoughts and events, at least within the context of a person's own subjective experience. Telling people that they shouldn't be so emotional or shouldn't let their emotions get to them is not only practically useless, it's also completely invalidating a person's experience. Sure, it's good to learn to process emotion and control behavior, but that's not the same as saying emotions are bad. This was longer than I intended it to be. Sorry everybody. That last one. My ex used to tell me that anxiety was fake and that I was just being a whiny baby. I would have full blown unable to breath paralyzing, blackout anxiety attacks and he would just say something along the lines of you need to stop freaking out all the time. He was the main reason for my anxiety. Typically they show pictures of sun breaking through trees and saying you don't need meds or nature is medicine or this is a real antidepressant, etc. Except some people do. Maybe they need both. Some people can find healing without medications, some cannot, and that's okay. 
not a therapist psychologist but I'm bipolar 2 with ADHD and I get advertisements for natural cures for BPD and ADHD. Diet, exercise, and supplements help but don't cure. I need antipsychotic medications to keep me from having visual and auditory hallucinations. A special salad isn't gonna keep those at bay. The self-care approach of, oh, you deserve to take a nap when you have multiple things to do or buy that thing to make you happy is crappy in my opinion as well. Self-care is actually cleaning your disgusting depression den and doing the crap on your to-do list that you've been putting off for weeks. When I'm hypermanic I spend excessive amounts of money on stupid crap I don't need, so treat yourself is horrible advice. This is super specific to me, but I'm sure others have this mentality as well. Amen. I can't help but think about the psychiatrist I was seeing when my mood stabilizer began to not work the right way. After two appointments the incredible advice I got was you know, for your condition, sleep is very important. Like what the frick be? I'm telling you I'm having fast switching and ideation and the advice is, oh, sleep harder lol, change psychiatrist. Everything happens for a reason, don't let it get to you. Absolutely not the right advice to give someone and actually can make things a lot worse. I appreciate the sentiment, but it can come across as very hurtful and maybe even vindictive when said in certain scenarios. On the flip, one of the best pieces of advice I ever received was from my therapist. This was in the pits of depression after someone had sexually assaulted me. She said that essentially I was holding on to a debt that would never be repaid and that in the end, the debt would only hurt Emmy and not the person who owes me. It is best to write it off as bad debt and move on. Actually saved my life, that one piece of advice. Obligatory not a therapist, but a doctor. People telling others you can just choose to not be depressed. Or that you need to self-care yourself back to a normal psychological state. Yes, healthy food, exercise, and enough sleep is definitely important. But too many people discredit the disease status of depression and claim it's just a feeling. No, sadness is a feeling. True depression needs therapy and possibly medication. Amateur analysis of mental health issue through comments or posts. You aren't qualified to diagnose someone. Don't do it. Even if you are, you should leave it to a professional environment where your words can actually have some positive impact rather than be slapping someone with your bachelor's degree for upvotes. About 90% of the time on Reddit if an argument is going south for someone they'll always take out the you need therapy card. There could be a little sentence with someone expressing their anger at one particular moment that somehow reveals a lifelong cry for therapy. I'm not a psychologist but when I had my depression my roommate told me to just pull myself together. We don't live together anymore. Med student and hopeful psychiatrist. Worst I've seen isn't the message it's the context. Instagram models with their extravagant lifestyles quoting love yourself. Maybe not understanding that a lot of the time they set the unrealistic bar that people attempt to reach in their real lives. Don't just shout buzzwords. Ground yourselves. Open up about your stories and how you overcame them with sincerity, even if it's at a detriment to your clout. Let people see through the looking glass, just for a second. I always see people post depressed quotes and things like 2020 made me realize who was there for and who wasn't. No, everyone's going through this pandemic bull's headache together. It seems as though everyone's struggling. Whether it's financially, mentally, or physically, health. We're all going through something and we shouldn't be acting selfishly expecting others to put their lives on hold to cater to ours. So much material is out there about recognizing toxic people, assuming we are all victims who are attracted to the wrong type of people. In therapy, you may actually learn how you have behaved in maladaptive ways that have contributed to strained or prematurely cut off friendships. Such a hard thing to recognize in healthy and even harder when you have a mental health condition. Massive amounts of respect to you and I hope you are doing great now. Iron app. Most advice you see online is horrendous. The first step towards a cure is admitting you are sick. Instead, most people encourage people with issues thinking their good intentions will cure the other person. In the long run, they have hurt them immensely. Does a social work account? If yes. The people who tell that bad things that happen to you aka mental illness, is a way for God to test you. Absolutely infuriating. 
My so's brother committed suicide almost 7 years ago, while their family was grieving. They were visited by a local pastor even though they were not religious. The pastor at one point said God doesn't give you anything you can't handle. To which my so replied he certainly gave my brother something he couldn't handle. No response from the God squad on that one. Two things that are well meaning, but I've seen them backfire. One, taking time off of school and or work to work on yourself. Look, I get the premise and I'm definitely not saying it's always bad, but I've seen it go south more often than I've seen it work. Schoolwork whatever provide opportunities to experience success and forward progress. Yes, they can be very stressful at times and there are certainly situations where they may be toxic. If that's the case, I begrudgingly understand walking away, but just quitting without a plan often creates stagnancy in life that is just terrible for mental health. I acknowledge that this is very much case by case, but if you're going to take time away from school work, come up with a plan first, have something you want to accomplish, if you don't have something to work on, now you're struggling with mental issues and bored. If it's work that you've left, it also leads to 2. Money The idea that money can't buy happiness is generally fine. The idea that worrying about money is shallow or that money doesn't matter is freaking stupid. I work almost exclusively with low income clients and I've had plenty who feel like they're being vain because they're stressed about money. I'm very straightforward in telling them that the people who claim money isn't important are either rich or delusional. Low income correlates with higher rates of depression. Chronic stress, poor health, less access to healthcare services, and just about everything else you don't want. Money matters and telling people that they shouldn't worry about it is incomprehensibly misguided. I understand the money thing completely. I'm on benefits and have been on the bare minimum for years and I've always been told I should be grateful I get anything. I'm pretty everyone who tells you to be grateful have never had to live on 40 pounds a week. I've just had my first increase benefits and for the first in my adult life I don't have to ration groceries. Clinical psychology doctorate student and mental health support worker here. Anything to do with getting a full 8 hours, eating healthily and exercise for depression. Yes, those things can have a very positive impact on low moods, but clinical depression usually stems from something and that problem needs to be addressed before these lifestyle tips can truly serve their purpose. I'm not a therapist but I have to chime in here. Subreddits like relationship advice etc have people that will do the absolute opposite of what they should be doing. People go to those places for advice on their love life and their worries and the majority of replies they get are sarcastic and hate filled emotional punches. Can no one give actual advice within giving the whole I've been giving advice here for years so I know more than you vibe. Not yet a therapist, though I'm currently in the process of applying to a clinical psychology program. Nearly a decade ago, as I was struggling with significant depression and suicidal ideation and was, myself, in therapy and on antidepressants, an individual who did not know this about me, as I was extremely private about this stuff, once went off about how depression is basically a label for a made up disorder and that if someone's feeling bad, they just need to do a good deed to feel better. I didn't say anything at the time, but I wanted to sock him in the face as hard as I could. I regret to this day that I didn't call him out on his crap, but at the time, I was ashamed to be struggling with depression, needing therapy and medication, and I froze up. It's weird how we are ashamed of mental illnesses but we have no problem telling people we broke our leg. When I want doing well I felt the same way. Now that I'm doing better I openly talk about it so I do my small part in getting it more normalized. Not a psychologist but as someone with ADHD, whenever someone tells me to concentrate, my brain shuts off whenever I try to force myself to concentrate and I have none of that sweet sweet dopamine rush at the end that you get. It's more difficult than that, stop recommending it every time I have something I have to do. As someone not with ADHD I have to say telling someone to concentrate is useless. Concentrating is hard work, I've never been very good at it and no dopamine rush. Sufferer 1. I'm unemployed, can't get a job, and I'm suffering from depression. Acquaintance 1. You are not your job, there's more to life than jobs. Sufferer 2. I'm lonely, can't find dates, sex, relationships, etc. Acquaintance 2. You need to love yourself first, there's more to life than sex. Sufferer 3. 
I can't stay motivated or finish anything, always getting lost in distraction. Acquaintance 3, you don't care enough and you need to take action. 1. Dyslexia isn't real, they just need to try harder, or dyslexia is only reading based. Dyslexia might be shorthand for the whole dies family of learning disorders but I assure you they are all real. 2. Depression is cured by sunlight. Yes going outside can help moderate some symptoms but it's not a cure. 3. Girls don't have ADHD. Girls don't have autism. Girls are socialized differently which causes some symptoms to be masked. 4. Teenagers can't get anxiety. Have you seen what's happening inside their brains? I'm amazed they aren't crawling on the ceiling. 5. All those stupid self-care posts that just promote avoidance of the task issue. Taking a walk might give you some space and a chance to recharge but that essay still needs to be written. That exam sat. Delaying this will only compound the issue. 6. They just need to toughen up grumble grumble back in my day. Back in your day there was lead in petrol and paint in children's bedrooms. We will just go and tell people's brains to make the right chemicals through sheer willpower. 7. My child is on the spectrum and that makes them special. Yes however as anxiety is often found in teens with autism let's treat that so they don't have to suffer needlessly. Are you preparing your child to live independently? See this for children with intellectual or behavioral issues. Do you want your child to be able to live independently or semi-independently or not? What is our end goal Karen? They dyslexia one really annoys me, especially when they dismiss it and go just read more. Use marijuana to cope with anxiety and depression. Marijuana is a depressant and causes more anxiety after prolonged use. It also can lead to psychotic features and mental disorders. Marijuana has a lot of good uses such as pain management and increasing appetite. It is not an effective treatment method for mental health issues. You just gotta pull yourself up by your bootstraps, kid. Thanks, now I can be so rat and deficient and perform a useless task. The focus on eating disorders is around anorexia. People associate it with anorexia because that's what the media write about. Take to the bone, for example. But most people with eds are at a normal weight and suffer from bulimia, binge eating disorder, and other varieties. When people think depressed and sad mean the same thing. I have depression and can feel happy. I still have depression. Same with anxiety. Anxiety and nervous don't mean the same thing. I have anxiety and can feel calm and safe. I still have anxiety. Depression and anxiety are chemical imbalances in the brain due to atypical development and or trauma. It isn't a passing thing or an act for attention or a moral failing. It's not a girl's only thing. It's not purely emotional. Having this off balance of thoughts and feelings all the time leads to exhaustion and pain and makes socializing and keeping a job very hard. It affects everything. Medicine helps. Medicine saves lives and improves them. Just because some ableist denies the existence of mental illness, it doesn't mean it doesn't exist. Imagine if someone went to a person in a wheelchair and told them to quit being a baby and just walk. Don't you think they would if they could? And don't you think saying that is cruel? It's like a wealthy person telling a homeless person to just buy a house to live in to solve their homelessness. If they had the ability to do that, wouldn't they already be under a roof? Clinical social worker here. There are so many god awful things that my clients come to me saying that they've internalized. I hate so much that they spend time in money and therapy just unlearn terrible things they've been forced to accept before we can even scratch the surface of trauma mental illness. But off the top of my head. 1. Calling things that anger you about a person toxic or calling someone abusive because they upset you. Words have power. Please don't belittle survivors. 2. Calling things that anger upset inconvenience you traumatic, nuanced, I'm aware. Trauma thresholds are very real psychological differences in people and what's traumatic for some isn't for others. Sure, but again, words have power. Please don't belittle survivors. 3. The use of OCD depressed and anxious as adjectives. Your straightening the pens is basic organization, not obsessive compulsive disorder. Feeling sad or disappointed or even melancholic is often not depression. Although it may be another valid psychological concern. Being nervous and being anxious are clinically distinct words for two very different sensations and experiences. Also the wildly inappropriate propensity for redditors to call things autistic is wild. 4. 
Yoga positive thinking juice cleanses meditation exercise etc. Please, medicate yourself if you feel it could help you. Frick those neurotypicals and hightail your butt to therapy. 5. Please don't use weed or CBD without talking to your therapist. And for the love of god don't think we don't know when substances, any substances, are being used in place of or in conjunction with your meds. We do. And we only want to help you. Most of us are team Akib and don't want to snitch on you, or legally can't unless you meet certain parameters. Double bonus. We sincerely only care about what could harm you. Phew. Super long and I could keep going but, yeah. Take online mental health advice with a mountain of salt if you take it at all. Without context. A lot of the depression and anxiety help you see online is pretty useless. It stems from the massive flood of positive psychology that has been going around for a decade. The last time I saw my gynecologist she said that when I come back in 6 months she wants me off my anxiety meds. She thinks I can self heal using yoga. Sounds like she should stay in her lane. I'm not a medical professional but the advice that pisses me off the most is when I hear other people say get outdoors, get some fresh air, depression can't hit a moving target, total load of BS for someone dealing with a mental illness. Another comes from a certain segment of society that says pray about it. God hasn't brought you this far to let you down now. In the group help addiction realm the loan that does the most damage is people in recovery don't need meds. The 12 steps is all you need. Seriously, if you are dealing with a mental illness, be it depression, bipolar, anorexia, or the plethora of other issues that people deal with, seek medical help. Don't listen to stupid people that don't hold a medical doctorate but want to throw around peep or advice. It wasn't on social media but I did watch a teacher of mine, who claimed to be a licensed therapist, tell a friend of mine that he was depressed because he listened to rap music and smokes weed. Oh and according to this jackass Asperger's isn't a thing and I'm not really autistic. Not a psychologist, but I do help run a suicide support advice blog. A lot of people have said that they've been told diet, exercise, and yoga. Also that it's all in your head. Lately there's been an increase in social media posts telling people that self care involves cancelling plans, eating junk food, not leaving the couch all day, and buying whatever you want. These are things that you shouldn't feel guilty about doing in moderation, but when done often can definitely worsen depression and anxiety. Self care is all about finding a balance between loving yourself and treating yourself well and pushing yourself to be your best. That means things like eating healthy, exercising regularly, socializing with loved ones, and generally pushing yourself out of your comfort zone often are just as important as treating yourself and having quiet restful days. I've seen some people post that mental issues are just excuses for your mistakes. That's in itself it's a problem because it doesn't allow self-reflection and understanding the condition you're in. Most of the be tough stuff can work on certain people that just need that last push. But on the other 99.9% .9 of people can lead to dangerous results if taken too seriously. As we've seen in the past week with the elections. You have as many hours in the day as Beyonce. Except that you don't. Beyonce has someone to cook, to clean, to organize her schedule, to watch her kids, etc. You have to do all that for yourself. Beyonce also has enough sources of income that if she needed to take an extended vacation, she absolutely could. You probably can't. This is supposed to be motivating thought, but it actually produces a lot of shame in people. Why can't I get everything done? I have as many hours in the day as Beyonce No. Honey, you don't. I have anxiety and panic disorder. If I had a dollar for every time someone told me to just exercise or it's all in your head I would have enough money to pay for all my therapy. The exercise one always pisses me off because while I do exercise and it does occasionally help, I can only do specific kinds because hard cardio simulates what panic attacks are like for me. I joined the cross country team in high school because I was told running would help. I learned very quickly that the feeling of being out of breath triggered my anxiety. Yoga and dance are the best for me but you shouldn't assume. Most people know what works for them. People who made a huge life decision based on reddit advice. How did it go? 
A couple of years ago, there was a random reddit post where someone was complaining about the lack of dating options in his city. It was a local subreddit. Someone on there told that poster to stop whining and do something about it. Register for paid dating sites. Do the work. Clean yourself up. Etc. Etc. They also mentioned that paid dating sites, unlike the free ones, have people who are actually serious about dating and the paywall keeps out most of the riffraff but you still got to put in the effort. I wasn't the OP but I thought the advice had merit. So after pondering it a bit I went on a dating site and paid for 3 months. They were doing a buy 3 months, get 3 month promo. 2 years later I'm getting married to a girl who is way too good for me. Thanks random dating advice OP. It's not as huge as some of the others here, but I bought my car based on advice from Reddit. I don't know anything about cars, but I had a budget and I knew what I wanted out of the car. Some nice folks on Reddit gave me a few options and some feedback on some Craigslist posts I found, and I got a really nice used Honda Accord that I love. Maybe not a huge life decision, but I followed advice on the dating subreddit and took the first step to asking a girl out. Turns out I can't read signals and she was not interested at all. At least I did something though. All the better, so that when the right person comes around, you won't be as afraid, cause you've already done it. Got therapy. My abusive mom would only take me to therapists that she was friends with. Anything I said to them would get told to her almost immediately. Needless to say, I had a major distrust for therapists after that. Was browsing a few subs one day and I came across one that was what to look for in a bad therapist or something and realized that everyone I've ever had more or less checked every single box. Then I realized they weren't supposed to tell anyone anything. Even if you were a minor, that was mind blowing. Eventually, I decided to try and look for one. Took a few tries but finally found one that accepts the fact that I cut off my parents and a court ordered restraining order does not mean that it's optional during therapy. Seriously I had one that thought a restraining order didn't matter because having a meeting with my parents was for therapy. It's been a while and it say it's going about as well as it possibly could. It's mainly trying to unlearn everything that my abusive parents put in my head which has proven difficult since that's what I always knew but I'm slowly coming to terms with the fact that they were wrong and only said those things to control me. You're on a brave journey, and you've got what it takes. What you don't have, there'll be a supportive community to help you. Keep going. I posted on our suicide asking how to get out of my self-destructive thinking and I'm still alive. Managed to get up and I'm slowly going up. I'm so happy to read that and wish you the best for your future. I know it's not easy but it's wonderful how you're getting better. Someone 4 months ago suggested I might be suffering having social anxiety. It took psychological help and have solved multiple different issues. Nothing major, but still, I feel great. I sought therapy for my ED, eating disorder years ago on advice from our low seeds and I'm feeling pretty great. Still fat, but way I, I healthier mentally and I eat normally now. Thanks Reddit for telling me it wasn't normal to cry about whether or not to drink a glass of water. Congratulations on your hard dong, or reading this again. Maybe you meant eating disorder, not erectile dysfunction. Saw some advice along the lines of if you're trying to meet new people say yes to things you might not usually say yes to. I had just moved to a new city for school and a guy asked me to form a study group with him. So I said yes. Then he asked me out to lunch. I didn't know him that well and normally would have said no but you know where this is going. I said yes to that too. We ended up hanging out more and became good friends over the rest of the year. Now we live together and have been dating for 5 years. All because I agreed to go eat a sandwich with him. Can't imagine my life without him. We still go eat at that sandwich shop sometimes and reminisce. But what ingredients were in the sandwich? This is the answer that we need to find love. There is a really excellent thread about paying down your mortgage v. Investing that got me into Reddit. Still a long way to go but it was really excellent advice. Someone recently suggested that I go frick myself. This riled me a bit at first, but after thinking it over, I went ahead and pursued the advice. It was wonderful, myself and I couldn't be happier. R self fuck shout out, NSW do not click. Because of some posts on a relationship advice sub I worked up the courage to ask out my crush. 
It was a case of do I risk our friendship for a relationship or just keep wondering. Well I told him and he felt the same way. I couldn't be happier. PSSSST. He knew you're a did handle and was the one posting the advice. Five years ago I had the courage to click on a link explaining the truth about Jehovah Witnesses. I was able to realize I was raised in a cult, left, and started my life. Publicly quit the religion, was announced excommunicated, lost all my friends, most of my family. Four of us left at same time though, but it was the best decision of my life and completely changed everything. From my city, job, sexuality, politics, and view of the world. So yeah, I always joke that Reddit kinda saved my life. This is me with the religion I was raised from. It truly opened a new door to the world for me. I started writing erotica 5 years ago for beer and pizza money after seeing someone talking about it on an Ask Reddit thread. I've been writing full time, though no more erotica, since early 2015. That thread gave me the kick I needed to start doing writing that made money and helped me transition to doing it full time. A T swelled at the thought of his winky flapping across them. That's all I have so far. In moving to Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, one redditor told to me watch out for the Pittsburgh left. This is basically when a person makes a really fast left turn against oncoming traffic. A truly solid advice. I'm still alive today after 3 years here. That said, I truly loathe this place, especially its drivers. It worked out great. Also FML. I left my wife on reddit advice. Don't get me wrong. I sort of wanted to do it too deep down. I'm not that weak minded. I just needed some strangers to tell me I should. Sometimes I'm really happy about it. Sometimes I'm filled with regret. I'm still thankful people gave me the advice and it was a hard decision. So I wasn't expecting it to be easy. You did the right thing. The best thing you can do in a relationship with someone if you're not sure you want to be with them is tell them or let them go. I can't pretend to understand what divorce feels like. I wish you all the best. Some people can be quite insightful. It's good to have an ear to the ground. I found a few that have helped me overcome hurdles in my life. Being single, a father, being broke, etc. It's a far better platform than Facebook. I'm a professor. But I studiously, pardon the pun, avoided teaching undergrads for years because of what I read on reddit by undergrads talking about their professors. I thought I was getting an image of what goes on in the mind of the average undergrad and it was so scary I just avoided them. Eventually, my number came up and I had to do it. I was so anxious that, in the beginning, I was literally sick every day I taught. However, I found my undergrads to be wonderful people, interested and interesting. They didn't expect to passively learn encyclopedic knowledge of the topic as I entertained them like a dancing monkey, still managing to make them feel duly challenged and handing out easy A's, all while acting a personal counselor and waiving my deadlines and lateness rules because of the way the stress of school affected their mental health. It really made my career much harder that I avoided teaching undergrads, and it was purely because of what I read here. Maybe not a life changing decision, but I started a job dog sitting on the side through a dog sitting website after I saw people on reddit talking about how great it is and posting videos of the dogs they had taken care of. I love dogs and was looking for extra money, and I had some experience, so I signed up and ended up making thousands of dollars over the few years I was active on the site. But the best part was spending time with tons of adorable dogs, meeting new people, and making great memories. I wouldn't have known about it if I didn't stumble across the opportunity on reddit. So it was a surprising and 100% positive experience. I made a post on Ask Men on a different username that gained a lot of following. It was about a date I went on, with car guy and I mentioned having had lunch with a guy friend named Liam before said date. Someone mentioned, poor Liam, I bet he is interested, go for it. Liam and I have been together for 6 years. Married for 3, we are about to start trying to conceive. Congrats on the sex. I'm always late to this party, but here goes. A seemingly benign reddit comment completely changed the course of my life. I was reading one of those what is your favorite life hack threads you see every week and ask reddit and the tip was if seat selection is free, pick a seat next to the emergency exit on a plane so you have more legroom without paying for first class. 
I was about to go on vacation in Europe so the day of my flight, I did exactly this. By picking my seat, I ended up sitting next to a British woman who was a radiographer, like me. She was on her way to Africa, both flying through Brussels, to work with a humanitarian healthcare organization. I asked her all about it, told her my own experience and how I would love to get involved. We parted ways in Brussels and I took her info. One year later she returned to Africa and I went too. We worked together with the same organization. There, I met another girl, a nurse who happened to also be a Canadian, like me. A few months after we'd both returned home, to opposite sides of the continent, we decided frick it, let's give it a shot. We both took a few weeks off and went traveling to Mexico, Cuba, and the southern states. She flew home to pick up her bags, quit her job, and flew across the country to be with me. It's been two years since that point and I'm so grateful I happened to stumble upon that particular ridic comment on that particular day when I was planning my trip to Europe. We're getting married next year. Imagine being at the toast, telling your friends and families you met your wife thanks to a ridic comment. Make sure you thank the op who gave that advice. Started counting calories. Sicko. No diet changes. Still eat junk. But limit daily calories. Have lost 8 pounds and am actually starting to eat healthier foods. All because someone commented along the lines of just start counting. Don't worry about the food. Congrats. I lost about 60 pounds following the same advice. Shout out to our low seat. Not just one post but tree law. I am an auto adjuster, but sometimes looked at other types of property. Got a claim for an older couple who had a car come barreling through their yard and took out this absolutely beautiful fruit tree. Broke it clean off at the base of the trunk, and it fell over into their roof. They had used it as a backdrop for family photos for years and the wife used the fruit. Can't remember what kind. For canning, baking and gifts. The whole front yard was very tastefully landscaped. And this tree was the centerpiece in front of a really pretty white house with a big front porch. Like seriously magazine worthy. But this wasn't even like a million dollar house. Anyway, the couple just wanted the cost for the roof repair and a sapling. I told them I'd do that. But they should really, like really really, get their insurance involved because that tree was worth way more than a sapling. They ultimately followed my advice and it made a 5k claim into something like a 50k claim. They deserved every penny of that too. That tree was just stunning. Tree law posts other wet dreams of redditors. Someone told me to stop taking an overdose and given that I didn't want to go to hospital at least try throwing it up. After a little bit I decided to stop and then I ended up going to hospital in the end and I'm still alive. They were wrong about it tasting better on the way back up though. I had this disgusting taste clinging to my mouth for hours. Maybe not a huge decision but the, the support I've received from Reddit for my art has been astounding and life changing for me. I'm still working on getting prints made to sell. Virus has made things a bit difficult. But the fact that people want to buy my work is mind blowing. I've never been good at anything in my life and without Reddit. I would still think I'm not really good at anything. That's great. I hope your work is a success. I once asked for relationship advice. Every reply was so harsh and toxic. All that was said was to leave my relationship when all I wanted was advice on how to fix it. 10 stroke 10 do not recommend. Not super life changing. But I posted on our Zoloft after being prescribed it. My doctor talked to me for 2 seconds then wrote me the prescription saying I had depression and I should start taking it immediately because it doesn't kick in for 2 weeks. I didn't even go in to talk about depression. I just had a rough week and cried to the nurse. I got really anxious because it was 100 milligrams and I had never taken an antidepressant before. Everyone commented and told me it was way too high and to stop taking it immediately. I had already taken one and it totally messed me up. I was crying and shaking uncontrollably. Grinding my teeth till I tasted blood. Like it was insane. Because of what reddit said I reported the doctor. Got transferred to a new doctor and she's been so kind and patient with me. I later wasn't diagnosed with depression either, just anxiety. The people who commented really helped me out and didn't make me feel stupid or crazy since I didn't know anything. It went really well. Someone recommended opening up to people and so far I'm really happy that I've chosen to do so. While this definitely doesn't apply to everyone. 
People seem to be happier to help each other than others might think. It's helped me take a much less cynical view of the world and has helped me feel more like we're in this together. I quit a toxic job during this bad economy and totally panicked and looked to rid it. Some told me that was stupid because we were hitting a recession and some were very supportive. But most gave me great tips for looking for a new job and I took their advice. Two weeks later I was offered two jobs and a week later I picked one. And I'm happy. I left my abusive boyfriend thanks to the relationship subreddit. I was on the fence about it all, and they made me see that it was no way to live, and that he was abusing me, throwing things, belittling my feelings, shouting at me, punching the wall, telling me how to dress or who to talk to, keeping me from my friends and family, temper tantrum at me not cooking the right dinner. I was 23 and had been with them for over 4 years. I was miserable. He made my life heck and it's a miracle I even graduated at all. If it hadn't been for those people on the subreddit, and especially one girl who had an eerily similar experience, I might have stayed even longer. Life is still very difficult, and it's all left me with some baggage. And yeah, I get that they easily push for the breakup already option, and that's a bit of a running joke. But I'm forever grateful. Sometimes. People need to hear that option from strangers to really go out there and take their life back. Not really advice. I said, but I posted a comment a bit over a year ago, and the response led to me moving across the country to a place I never even imagined living. Put less cryptically, I mentioned my expertise in a comment and ended up getting a job across the country. A long time ago, I threw away all my socks and bought 50 of the same pair. I haven't spent any time organizing socks in over 10 years. That's actually genius. Not really advice but more the interactions. I used to be quite judgment online and quick to insult. Simple interactions with some decent people made me realize that I was acting poorly. I would like to think I'm more polite now. Applying this in my real life as well. It's heartbreaking habits but it's getting a lot better and it's made my life easier. Less conflicts and more results. Maybe not big, but after reading a lot on our askmen I'm much more at ease and confident going for the men I want and complimenting them. As well as taking the extra steps to make them feel desired. All the posts I've read changed my perspective a lot on how to interact with them and I've been making better and more respectful decisions based on that. Reading about men liking all sorts of bodies also made me more okay with mine even though it's not perfect. Also our fitness and our body weight fitness changed my life. I've been working out seriously and trying and succeeding and losing weight. I am with you on this. Great to read men's views. On my old account I stopped a guy from committing suicide. He posted up his final goodbye to the world but I sat up all night and spoke to him until he was okay. We kept in contact so I could make sure he was okay and became good enough friends to add each other on FB. May have blocked him after that when I saw his posts were all really racist, homophobic or majorly anti-vax and claiming it's the Christian way on top of being a bit creepy on my photos and adding all my friends for whatever reason to. Still wonder to this day how he would react if he found out the girl who saved him was actually a bisexual atheist. Bro. I've been married for 20 years and together with my husband for 25. With info from relationship advice and the ask men section, I've learned over the long whiles a better way to communicate with my husband. Nothing big, it is just that I've learned to read his cues better and how to change how I react to things that used to enrage me. I am now very clear on why things upset me instead of assuming he already knows. For example. Thought my wife was cheating on me and nefariously planning to betray me even further than that. Unfortunately things played out exactly as the people in that reddit thread predicted. I was fortunate enough to listen to their advice before she made a real big move. Good for you dude. Stopped using weed. Was a bit of a weed addict for some years. Started following our leaves half-heartedly one night. Always thought I was abnormal in my usage of cannabis and in the effects it had on me. Psychosis, anxiety, insomnia etc. Because in popular belief, cannabis users are represented as chilled out and laid back. On this sub, I saw people living the same things I did. Made me feel way less alienated. After reading many testimonials and comments of people presenting the process and the benefits of their withdrawal, it convinced me to get my crap together and stop. 4 months weed free, THX covered, 
Never been better. No regrets. Almost no thoughts about using anymore. Almost 2 years ago, I posted a link to some of my own artwork but took it down because of my lack of self confidence. Somehow before I took it down, a pretty lady saw it and DM'd me to ask where the link went. We chatted a bit and she suggested we keep in touch. We are very happily still dating. So that one went well. I bought a bidet. Best thing to happen to my butt. Ever. Honestly. If you only knew how primative wiping crap off your butt is. You savages. There was that guy who broke up with his wife and then she killed all their kids as a revenge. Which still means the advice was good. The issue was the execution. Maybe execution is the wrong word. I'm late to the party, but still thought I would share. I left my dead bedroom marriage after reading posts on that sub. The best advice I saw was there's always going to be an excuse not to leave. First it's because you live together. Then it's because you're married. Then it's because you have kids. You just become more and more intertwined until you feel like you literally can't leave. There's never a right time, but that doesn't mean it's not the right choice. It was exactly what I needed to read to leave my marriage. Best decision I've ever made. This advice hits home. What's the most real relationship advice you can give? It's fine to not always want to spend 100% of your time with your spouse. Not every moment of every day is going to be bliss and sometimes it really takes some effort. I love my wife to bits, but there are some days when I would just like to do things by myself. It doesn't mean our relationship isn't great but it can be really refreshing to just take a stroll around a shopping center, or go and get some food alone or something. This 100%. My spouse goes weekly to her Pathfinder game. That's his alone time. I occasionally go to a punk show or have a BRW my friends. It can be even simpler. I will go read a book in the other room and get my alone time. He likes to cook. So heck start up in the kitchen and I stay away while he listens to his music. Everyone needs alone time. Go on holiday together. If you can agree on food, sleep soundly, compromise on activities and do your own thing one of the days and not get mad at each other you stand a good chance of lasting a while. I love my boyfriend to bits and miss him a lot. We don't live together yet, but boy do I like sleeping on my own in bed sometimes. Space is healthy. Just because you're in a relationship doesn't mean you have to live in each other's pockets. Agreed. I love my boyfriend, but I also love sleeping in my own bed sometimes. 1. Don't expect the other person to be able to read your mind. 2. Be a team, not opponents. 3. Everybody farts at some point. Communication is the foundation upon which everything else is built. They say don't go to bed angry not because anger does something while you're sleeping, but because it means you didn't communicate properly and you're giving up on trying. Be calm. Actively listen. Do not dismiss your partner's statements. Assume good faith. It's you and me versus. The problem not me versus. You. If something's bugging you, talk to your so about it. If you feel enraged about something, wait until you're well fed, well rested, with warm extremities before talking about it. But talk about it at the first opportunity, calmly, rationally, and honestly. Keep the discussion limited to that one narrow thing. If something's bugging your so, hear them out. Never think well I'm not bothered by that, so it's not a problem. Think my so is bothered by this, and that's a problem. If you think the concern is unreasonable, frame the discussion as solving the problem of your so is being unhappy. The worst fights and arguments happen over trivial things. Because it's not the trivial thing that's actually causing the problem. It's probably a series of things, or a general lack of satisfaction. And the toothpaste cap being left off is just the instigator of the fight. If you communicate often and openly, these things will not fester. They won't pile up, and you won't get into such fights. You have to be honest with them. Especially when it's hard to do. Me and my boyfriend get uncomfortably real with each other sometimes. And something we have both learned is to listen to criticism without getting defensive. And when giving criticism, we don't attack each other, no matter how angry or sad we are at each other. I've had him call me out for certain behaviors that nobody has ever called me out on. And I've done the same for him. We're both better people for it because when we get it all out on the table, we have no choice but to work on ourselves. Your spouse isn't going to be perfect. You're not going to be perfect. There will be mistakes and misunderstandings. 
What really matters in a relationship is not being perfect, but how you handle the imperfections of yourself and your spouse in a respectful, reasonable way. This is the best comment here and the ones about communication. Learning how to be bored together is important. You don't have to be on the go, doing stuff and planning stuff and being fun and exciting all the time. It's okay to just sit around and not do anything and not talk to each other. It's not unhealthy, I promise. There's a reason it's called the honeymoon phase and eventually you won't have as much to talk about other than how the day went or might not always feel those butterflies in your stomach when you think about them. That's when it becomes a test in the relationship and you both have to work on it to make it work. You will get into fights but learn to get over them or I doubt it'll last. Resentment can kill feelings for someone. You trade butterflies for familiarity, excitement for comfort. Sometimes you have to spend years with crappy people to realize what you deserve. It was never a waste, you needed the experience to figure out what works best for you or what to avoid. You'll never forget your exes, they were there for a reason. Conversely, sometimes you need to spend years in bad relationships with good people before you realize that you're being a crappy person. Sometimes it's hard to see, and harder to admit. Guy here. This probably sounds simple but here's what I've learned. Know yourself, where you're at in life. If you're in a shit storm, legal crap, money crap, drugs and alcohol crap, legal crap, you're probably not ready for anything serious. Clean up your act first, be honest, no matter how freaked up crap is, if you want to move forward in a serious way, all the cards got to be on the table. Take it slow, get to know each other, but in the end no secrets. There is some crap that is nobody's business but I ain't talking about that. Know her, what she's been through, and what she wants out of life. You both need to be pretty much on board, you need to be heading for the same thing. Kids, buy a house or gypsy life, don't matter. Keep a sharp eye on things, you need to make sure she's doing okay and let her know you're doing okay. Same with her to you, after that it's just dodging stupid. Lots of wisdom here. No secrets and be on board with each other's plan is big. Relationships are work. They aren't always fun, you won't always be madly in love, and you can't put them on a shelf and ignore them. But they shouldn't be all work. Always be mindful and thoughtful to that person's love map. Like they might need a quick text every morning when you get to work letting them know you're safe. Make zero sense to you but knowing it's something small and means the world to them. Well why the heck not? They might get stressed out and you helping to clean the house for when they've finished work might mean more to them than someone else you've been with who wanted flowers to show love. Know what it is that your partner loves and makes them feel loved too. A little off topic, but I've found that prioritizing the relationship correctly helps a lot. My roommate is my best friend, but he's a roommate first, a co-worker second, and a friend third. We talk about finances and housework completely differently than we shoot the crap. This helps maintain efficient lines of communication regardless of what's going on. When someone shows you who they are, believe them. If they're mean, if they're vindictive, if they use you, if they show you that they don't really care about you, believe them. If they make you feel inadequate, on edge, scared, nervous, unworthy, or like a disappointment, believe them. If they're entitled, narcissistic, sociopathic, manipulative, or unfair, believe them. Life isn't a movie. You can't fix people who don't want to be fixed. More often than not they just are who they are. So take off the rose-colored glasses and stop thinking love will find a way. If it isn't working, change it. Don't spend your precious time lamenting over a person who wouldn't genuinely lament over you. This sounds bleak I know, but relationships and love are supposed to be the most beautiful thing in the universe. If your relationship is not improving your quality of life on the aggregate, you need to seriously reassess what you want in life, because you deserve better. You only get so much time to find people in your life that make it worth living. Don't get caught up on people who will make you wish you never lived it. Yes. You gotta make sure you're choosing them as advertised, not falling in love with their potential. I don't think your perspective is bleak at all. I think it's balanced and disillusioned. In related vernacular, choosing to believe who someone is, is a great example of living life on life's terms. It's not always easy but it gets you out of a lot of unnecessary wrestling matches. 
probably not gonna get this right but it hit me the hardest after spending 5 years in a toxic relationship. The idea that everyone in their lives is working towards creating a jigsaw, each part of their live, be it work, relationships or hobbies, make up parts of the jigsaw. Everyone's is different. Some people's careers make up the edges, the less important and interesting parts, some people's are their relationships. What's important is the center of the puzzle. That's what people are working towards, their lives goals. When you're in a relationship, your puzzles combine, you eventually start working towards a share goal. You might make some compromises on what goes to the outer edges but you should both be working towards the same center. Occasionally, it turns out that the centerpiece you were working towards with your so isn't what you thought it was. This sucks. And believe me, it really freaking does, but there's nothing wrong with cutting your losers. If you're going for a different jigsaw, and the pieces don't fit, you won't get a coherent picture. I hope I explained it right. And yes, it has been taken from Daniel Sloss. He puts it way better than I do so I would recommend checking him out on Netflix. Daniel Sloss is the crap, and I think you worded it very well. If you go into a marriage long term commitment with the impression that you'll be happy all the time and your life will only change for the better, you are absolutely wrong. Be realistic that there will be days you won't be able to stand each other, your lives may absolutely hit rough patches and you will not agree on how or why that situation occurred or even how to get out of it, and the like. A study of long term relationships found that successful relationships have one major thing in common. The spouses are verbally supportive of each other's interests and thoughts. For example, if your spouse is very excited about Pokemon Go and wants to tell you all about the monsters they caught that day, the supportive spouse would listen to them talk about it and be excited for what they are excited about even if they don't know how the game's played or think that it's stupid. The couple that's going to divorce, that other spouse would say I don't care, that game is for kids or be generally dismissive of the conversation and change topics, support what they are excited about as much as you can. Even if it's just listening with a smile on your face while you do a shopping list in your head. I completely agree with you. My fiance loves magic DND and I really don't have any interest in either, but I love listening to him talk about it because he's so passionate about it. It makes him happy to talk to me about it, and it makes me happy to see him talk about something he actually enjoys. If you feel like you're having a hard time getting a girlfriend or boyfriend, then you're doing it wrong. It's not something to get, it's a vibe you have with someone and it's not promised. This. Thank you. My roommates constantly complain that they wish they had a relationship like mine and my boyfriends or feel like the world owes them for never giving them a boyfriend. <laughs> Healthy boundaries. It's important to be supportive when your partner is going through a hard time. However it's not healthy to take on your partner's burdens as your own. Analyzing the unhealthy patterns in your early relationships can be helpful for figuring out difficulties you may have in this area. If you're starting to doubt a relationship, do not drag it out. End it so you don't waste precious time finding someone who is a better fit. This is gonna go against what a lot are saying but yeah being bored together and okay with that is important but also keep it fun try and break the routine with surprises and treats and events the little things that break the relationship routine. Keep it alive and fun never settle for a set routine. You are never obliged to stay in a relationship. Doesn't freaking matter what someone has threatened. If you aren't happy frick em. Comma if you aren't happy frick em. And if that doesn't help, leave em. Don't go to sleep angry as bulls, especially if you have little kids. If you and your partner are sniping at one another, disengage and get some sleep if it's possible. Most of the fights my husband and I ever had was because one or both of us were exhausted and or hangry. But set a time to pick it back up. If my husband just says frick it and goes to bed during an argument I'm pee. But if he says I need sleep, let's talk tomorrow after dinner I'm much better. I need to know it's going to be resolved in a timely fashion, and we're both much more reasonable after sleep and cooling down. During an argument, never say something you'll regret later. Arguments are temporary, but people don't forget hurtful, personal comments. Also, the one that loves the least always controls the relationship, based on observing family and friends relationships. In all honesty, I don't even buy the whole, I said it out of anger. I didn't mean it, line. Anger makes people care less about holding their tongue. 
thus more likely to be brutally, even cruelly, honest. People mean the crap they say in anger. Choose them. It's not about winning an argument, making a point, having enough time, or giving enough gifts, any of that crap that makes your heart either sore or tremble in the moment. It's about choosing them, knowing them, learning them. Equally as crucial, they choose you back. It's about choosing this person to hold your hand through every moment, of every day, for the remainder of anything and everything you will ever experience. Every decision you make has them as a factor. It's about respect and admiration, and giving credit where it is due. It's about the truth, about trusting them with the truth, and trusting them to tell it. Choose them, completely. Character is action. Deep character is how a person behaves under stress. An instructor told me this in a writing seminar but it's a great real life observation about relationships. If you have someone who keeps focused and cool under pressure, value that individual. It's a magnificent character trait. If you're together with someone who rages at minor inconveniences and finds scapegoats instead of solutions, that's a person of weak character. Most of us are somewhere in between those two extremes. We can get better at it with effort. Yeah just because you work on building your character doesn't necessarily mean your soul will make the same journey. A partner with especially bad character will take that effort for granted. It will never be enough. You could walk on eggshells all week but then someone cuts them off at an intersection and you have to endure their curses. But I'm not yelling at you, they think is a good enough excuse. They're still being terrible company. Most people with weak character know how to keep focused and cool under pressure. They choose the situations where they can get away with venting. They'll work on improvement for a little while but they'll always relapse and usually get worse. And they would rather get the upper hand than solve problems. It's easy to take a person with good character for granted because what they do seems effortless. Part of what they achieve is emotional maturity but part of it takes real effort. All relationships take effort. Some are worth the effort and some are not. Figure out whether there's enough strength of character on both sides to be worth the effort you put in. Love is a choice, not a feeling. Not talking about sexuality here. The butterflies go away eventually, it's inevitable, but you can choose to be committed anyway and build something beautiful together. Conversely, attraction is a feeling, not a choice. You cannot negotiate someone into being into you if they aren't. Sometimes you can give everything you have and be your absolute best self and still have it not be enough for someone. If that happens, it's on them, not you. Another way of phrasing this, it's not anyone's fault. Some people aren't compatible. If you can't be what the other person needs, whether you think that need is legit or not, then that relationship will not work out. That's just incompatibility. It happens. It's neither person's fault. A Bojack Horseman quote. It's funny. When you see someone through rose-colored glasses, the red flags just look like flags. Except when you're wrong. Except that your partner won't always accept they're in the wrong. Accept apologies. Accept compliments. Be accepting. Don't ever eat her leftover food she's saving. It's not okay. It's not ever okay. I ate my girlfriend's three remaining hot wings long ago and she still brings it up years later. You fricked up. 1. If S he wanted to, S he would. 2. Never marry, move in with have a kid with, or make serious financial commitments to anyone until the honeymoon period is over. Relationships are not there to fix you. If you aren't happy with yourself, the relationship won't make that a reality. When you want your partner to be fit, attractive, and dress well, don't forget that they want that as well. Want the best for the other person, not for yourself. That's why jealousy is poison. You want your SF to look good, but only for you. Get a clue. Give them something to want in return. Be a success. Take care of yourself. Learn something every day. Don't waste your time. Be kind and demonstrate that daily. You get what you give. Do the dishes. Some relationships aren't meant to be permanent. Some friends, family, and lovers are only supposed to be in your life for a short time. They will impact your life. For better or worse, but don't feel obligated to keep them around forever. This too shall pass. Nothing is planned. You're just an animal navigating an environment of other animals. Nothing is going to be consistent. People say to not date your best friend. Don't listen to that. 
If you become best friends first, trust me, they are worth it. Enter a relationship without planning on it ending. Being best friends helps the communication, love, trust, and truth be real. Been with my husband for 13 years. We were best friends for a couple years before that. I wouldn't change a thing. A great relationship isn't a 50 stroke 50 split. You need to be able to put forth more than 50% sometimes to help when your partner isn't all the way there and vice versa. Don't argue if you're hungry or tired. Don't argue if you're angry about something else that they have nothing to do with. Don't argue if you're distracted by something else. Don't argue over texts PMZ TC. Don't argue about things neither of you can control. Take a nap. Get some food, let other things pass. If it's still a problem, then argue. But most importantly, own your mistakes. You fricked up, admit to it and move forward. Things that test your relationship will test them for longer than a day. I love my GF. Love the crap out of her. After roughly 2 years of dating we moved in together in July of last year. We knew there would be an adjustment period. But we didn't expect it to take longer than 3 months. We couldn't go more than 4 or 5 days without an argument. Sometimes we were arguing before we even left for work in the morning. We thought we had planned so well. Thought the I's were dotted and T's were crossed. They weren't. It took 3 months to work out the kinks. But we're better now than we ever were before. I wouldn't change anything that has happened. Big changes to your life will take time to settle. Be prepared to feel like your relationship has regressed before it moves forward. Don't be with bad or mean people, or at least not bad in any way that bothers you. Also don't be a bad or mean person. Successful relationships are really just too decent. Good people who like each other a lot, because they're decent and good, they are going to be nice to each other. Because they're good, they actually want others to be nice to them. So it all works out. Honeymoon phase is a real thing. Wait until it passes before making any life altering decisions. I know you feel like you've known each other forever and like soulmates. Wait until you get on each other's nerves a couple of times legitimately. Not just little things but real things that actually bug you. Now see how you handle it together as a couple and as yourself. Life isn't a race. To paraphrase Red Foreman, relationships are hard. You gotta learn to filter out the bulls. Learn what you're willing to put up with and let it roll off your back. But also establish what you're not going to put up with and shut it down immediately the second it appears. If you break up because of that, so be it. Watch how a potential mate treats others, waiters, people in the drive through when getting fast food, other people in line at the grocery store, their family members, etc. Pay particular attention to how they treat people over whom they have a social advantage, subordinates employees, the ugly or awkward friend, and so on. Do they talk behind their backs? Do they mock them? Do they give a look of disgust when they turn away? That's how they're going to eventually treat you. A boy I like were walking together, and he stopped mid-conversation to help a slug cross the sidewalk safely. It seriously made me want to marry him. You may be super compatible in every way, and they may make you feel like you've never felt before. That still doesn't mean it would work out. They might not love you the same way. Everyone has their own demons. And sometimes they spill out and sour the relationship even when no one wants it to happen. You can only let go. And stop clinging to your memory of that person. This is the thing I am struggling with most after my recent breakup. It's a hard thing to accept but I know it is one I don't have a choice on. Time will heal my wound and I will meet someone who is willing to work with me rather than shut me out. Thanks for saying this. Even if it is just a vent, don't say anything in a negative light about your partner to a friend family member. Unless it is a bad relationship, the good moments outweigh the bad. But you probably don't tell friends family members all the good stuff. If you are frustrated enough to vent to someone outside your relationship, think about it and is it worth making the person you love look like the less than amazing person they are? And if you still feel strong enough to vent about whatever happened, maybe that need to be a conversation you have with your partner, not about them. I don't feel like typing a lot so, be honest, truly, no bulls honest, listen, don't listen just because you should, listen because you care, step 1a, care? Communicate yourself honestly to them. Don't hold back. 
Tell them who you are. Rinse and repeat. Honesty, with yourself and your partner, is so important to having a healthy, lasting relationship. It's so much better than living a lie or trying to entertain falsehoods. What's your most useful street smart piece of advice? If you're in trouble, that is, lost or searching for something specific, in a foreign country, decide who is going to help you. Do not let someone random approach you and start leading you off to some random butt location just because you were looking lost. By merely looking like you know where you're headed these people that prey on tourists will completely ignore you. My best bet is always to find a well dressed person. Ideally someone in a business suit or similar, who looks like they have somewhere to be and no interest in talking. They are usually willing to help with quick basic stuff like directions, but they're also very unlikely to frick with you. If you're meeting someone on one of those exchange apps like OfferUp, Close5, or even Craigslist, always meet in a public and well lit area, preferably one with cameras. McDonald's and Starbucks are safe bets for me, never bring strangers to your house. Even if nothing goes wrong, they might remember where you live and something bad could happen in a few years from the meetup. To piggyback on this, most police stations, at least in the US have a designated meeting place out front for these types of things. Someone looking to scam you might go to a public place, but probably not right outside the police station. If a person is invading your personal space in an aggressive manner, create some distance and keep a guard up. I've witnessed countless. Clueless people get knocked the heck out with a sucker punch because they wanted to appear non-threatening to a person who is clearly trying to cause them great bodily harm. I always do the thinking pose where you cross your arm but have your hand under your chin. Don't walk while staring at your phone. Stop somewhere. Pop inside a store or even a doorway to answer that text. Also turn down the brightness at night. You'll preserve your night vision. Just watch your dang surroundings. 99% of the stuff that'll happen to you is not a stand-up fight where the attacker makes themselves known to you and challenges you to your face. You know, usually it's more than one person attacking you from different angles, none of which you expect. Be aware of what is going on around you at all times in as much as you are able. It's called situational awareness. Keep an eye on the door. If strangers walk up to you asking for money or a moment of your time especially if they are fast talkers your answer should be sorry man I don't have any cash or I got to run man and keep moving. Don't stop in place. Keep the interaction as short as possible. Play stupid. Had a guy standing in the street try and stop me to talk when I was pulling out of a church parking lot. Heck no. I'm not stopping for some random guy in the middle of the street trying to get specially me to stop. Be aware of your surroundings. Look behind you, whether you're walking or driving. If you notice the same car behind you for miles, don't drive home. Go to another location and make three right turns. If they're still behind you, they're following you. Once when I left work, I noticed a car behind me for a few miles. They got on and off the highway when I did. Weird, I ended up zigzagging through a random neighborhood just to see, and sure enough, they were following me, but started driving to the nearest police station. They eventually gave up, but I have no idea what that was about. It still freaks me out to this day. If you're in a sketchy part of town and a group of 3-4 dudes politely say excuse me or some crap to ask you for a lighter all the time or call you over for literally any reason, get the frick out of there, you freaking idiot. Recently I keep hearing about dumb fucks walking over like HR can I help and getting robbed. I don't understand why this needs to be said, but it clearly does. There is no such thing as glory. Focus on getting things done rather than on getting praise for not having done anything. Have the ability to avoid sharing personal information, no matter how close to people, or peer pressured, you are. By the same token, don't ask too many questions, know which questions to ask, be polite. I was out smoking outside a bar in my town. Guy started talking to me and asking me my last name, where I live and all sorts of stuff. He got very pee when I wouldn't answer things. Starting going on about he could help me making the thousands of dollars a day that he makes. I think I avoided being a drug runner that night. 2002 Red River Riot. 
shootout between Hells Angels and Mongols in a Lachlan NV casino. I was in that bar as they started to congregate, looked up from my beer, Hells Angels on my left and Mongols on my right. My gut followed my brain and I got the heck out of there. Nothing good comes out of two notorious gangs being in the same bar. Three dead and several injured. Walk confident but don't walk cocky. If you walk with confidence it shows that you know how to hold your own. If you walk with cockiness it shows that you think you know how to hold your own and are itching to prove it. Walk confidently and resting be face. You'll get told to smile a lot but no one will mess with you. Engage and show outward signs of friendliness, but not weakness. Confidence and friendliness puts people at ease and also doesn't make you a target. Don't carry crap around with you that you can't afford to replace. Don't tell anyone who asks your shoe size. Don't give anyone rough the impression you're better than them. Mix and match for more effective street survival. Follow your gut, and not in the, my gut told me to wear purple today, a real, true gut feeling is hard to explain, but you'll know it when you feel it. Always listen to that instinct, because it usually only kicks in during extreme instances of fight or flight. Also, always kick for the dong. If a guy pulls a knife on you and tries to mug you, you take your money clip with a $50 bill. You go you want my money, go get it then you run the other direction. The answer on the street is always no. Don't debate. Don't negotiate. Don't even wait for the end of the sob story. Anyone approaches you unsolicited and wants something from you. The answer is a forceful no followed by get the frick away from me if that doesn't work. My version of this is also, don't ever get your wallet out in public if it's not an ATM. Don't sign up to anything in the street or on the doorstep. If a threatening person approaches you looking for a fight say something that makes sense, implies a history, but is completely nonsensical, but very confidently and calmly. Example, I know but I don't think it will fit. I've been looking at them for a while and they are just too big. The hedges over in a Seattle were much smaller, but these are much too tall. They just aren't going to work at all. If the person is processing language, which they typically are, their brain will be very confused. While they are processing the information, context, and your demeanor they are likely to lose a lot of their adrenaline and be much less likely to fight, at which point you can reason with them or leave. Most people get themselves really hyped up and just need an interruption out of their recursive loop. Don't wear headphones while walking. You just tell people you have something worth stealing and it makes you easy to sneak up on. Don't take shortcuts in dark places at night. Walk around with your head high. No one is going to try and mug someone who looks like they are ready for a fight. People want easy targets. The only proper who push for honor in fights are the ones who can win with brute force. Honor doesn't mean crap if you lose. The best way to win a fight is to run away. Jokes on them. These headphones are crap. Don't present yourself as a potential victim. Walking alone and not feeling safe. Clench your fists and start talking to yourself like you're angry. Maybe try to bite the side of your face. People tend to avoid people they think they are already unstable or emotionally volatile. That's so true. Save my life in Paris. Late at night. Carry some extra cash in your shoe when visiting a foreign country. If you happen to get mugged, they usually won't check there and this may be all you have left to. Feed yourself. Find transportation. Get back home. Offer a bribe. Probably sounds extreme, but for people who have had their wallet passport ID and all their money taken, even a hundred bucks can go a long ways. If a guy attacks you he expects you to go for the eyes or crotch and can protect against it. They don't expect you to go for the ear. And when you have a grip on someone's ear they will go wherever you want. Preferably a hard surface, at speed. When someone yells pickpocket start searching for your wallet in the groin area and exclaim thank god my wallet is safely tucked between my testicles. The pickpocket will see this and assume that the wallet is there. These people usually have very supple and delicate hands so when they try to take your wallet you will instead get a pleasant fondling to your genital area. If someone is standing a bit too close to you for no reason and then purposefully moves out of your line of sight as you adjust your body position so that you can see them better, they are up to no freaking good. I had a guy sidle up to me a line in Walgreens. He started kind of nervously looking around and shuffling his feet. I go to adjust my stance so I can see him better in my peripheral. 
He moves to where he's not right behind me. I move again. He moves again. Now it's my turn in line. The guy walks past me and goes outside. I buy my items and the guy is standing out there. I go to walk to my vehicle and he blocks my path. I finally say are we gonna have a problem here and finally look him right in the eye. I'm not a killer but I have legit martial arts training including multiple competitions. I can handle things if need be. The dude mutters something about being on my side then wanders off. Trust your guts and don't let Shady M sneak up on you. If you're ever getting kidnapped, try and throw them off their rhythm. And never let them take you to the secondary location. Walking with earphones in is a no-no. I get that it can keep creepy people from hitting on you, but if your attention slips you're super vulnerable. Should always be aware of your surroundings and what is going on around you. Removing a sense doesn't seem like the safest idea. I always find it helpful to walk around with headphones on, but no music. It keeps away creeps but at the same time you're still aware of your surroundings. It helps with not stopping when approached because you can reasonably pretend not to have noticed people. If you flat out ignore some with no apparent reason they might get angry, but stopping and acknowledging them is an even worse idea. Don't ever answer to someone yelling hey from across the street. I tell my kids to never turn around or acknowledge anyone who refers to you as hey because if they know you, they will call you by your name. If they don't know you, they, especially a grown man, have no business asking anything from a young kid, teenager or even an adult. Granted I was an adult every time this happened but sometimes they were being helpful. Hey you drop your wallet. Hey you got charlotte paper on your shoe. Hey you still got the tag on your jeans. Hey be careful walking your dog there's a skunk on that side of the street. I did notice a strong smell but couldn't place it. If you are getting into a fight, you are getting hurt. If you are getting into a knife fight, you are getting cut, and probably stabbed, you are not going to pull some John Wick crap wand walk away completely unscathed. The moment you enter into an altercation with a bladed or blunt weapon, and your attacker is armed in a similar fashion, you need to come to the realization that best case scenario, you both end up in an ambulance on the way to an er. Uh, worst case scenario, one or both of you don't get the opportunity to. If you ever get arrested, whether you're guilty or not always get a lawyer and don't say a word to anyone else but your lawyer. Yes, if you're innocent you can say something incriminating. False confessions happen all the time. Split your money cards up on different areas of your body when you're traveling. Shoes, inner pocket, pants pocket, sock, etc. Also, leave a security method of payment wherever you are staying. If you get robbed you'll then have a way to pay for things and not be stranded. Especially when traveling somewhere, I use Starbucks as safe zones. Free Wi-Fi, open early and late, charging batteries and restrooms, gives me a chance to come up with a game plan if I'm lost. Also good idea to carry a charger for your phone. Criminology graduate here. The only thing I can definitely remember about this is that many attacks start by asking you something to distract you. For example, do you have the time then when you check your watch or phone the person draws their knife and holds you to it. Best advice is to stay alert at all times as many people have already said. If someone asks me the time and I'm suspicious I just guess ha, huh? sorry innocent suspicious stranger. A big no no I saw this a lot from ladies after a night out. Please do not walk down the street at night by yourself on the phone either talking to someone or worse, texting. This does not put attackers off even if it makes you feel better. It just makes you more vulnerable by distracting you. What can the person on the phone do to help you if someone attacks you? Unless they are nearby coming to meet you. Get picked up. Walk with friends or call a cab. Please. Print out fake $100 bills with Danny DeVito's face on it. If someone tries to rob you, hand the folded bills to him and try to get out as fast as possible. If you live, he got memed. If you don't, he got memed anyways, so it's okay. Walk in like you own the place and nobody will question you. Pro tip wear an orange safety vest and or carry a clipboard and people will believe anything and even help you. Here are a few things I was taught on the first day on my Krav Maga class. 1. In any situation, keep engaging in a fight as the last resort. 2. Most often shouting as loud as possible is a good strategy. The last thing an attacker rapist want is attention. 
3. When you see someone in danger, don't jump into a fight, just because you took the class or otherwise, to save someone. The first thing you should do is call for more help, anything police, other people, security guards. Let people talk about themselves and actually listen. Ask questions and find a way to connect with them on a common interest. This comment is very unlike the previous ones. Whenever you see criminals or hard cases doing g thangs or bad bus stuff on TV, shake your head in amusement and say no way, man, totally fake. He wouldn't last 5 minutes where I come from. Then everyone will know you're not to be fricked with and you'll be left in peace. Ways I can tell you're a gangster. Hard cases. G thangs. Bad butt stuff. You wouldn't last 5 minutes where I come from. If your car breaks down and you have to leave it, remember to get all of your belongings out of it. But this does include the license plate. I just recently had my car break down and the license plate stolen not a day later. Never eat lunch at your desk if your company makes you clock out for lunch. Eat in your car if you have to, but breaking that 8 hour monotony is vital to keep a healthy attitude and your sanity. IDK if this is as much street smart advice or poverty advice, but if you grew up poor and don't have money for college, do not start at a university, start at a community college. It will be way easier on you, it's cheaper by a lot, and you'll end up getting your results at a more steady guaranteed pace. Also choose a major that'll make you money. IDC about this passion bulls. I think you need to balance the passion and the payout. It's much easier to do well in something if you care about it, but you have to be able to make a living from that. If you hate what you're doing it'll be really hard to excel if it doesn't come naturally to you. If you have to walk through a sketchy neighborhood, stick to crowded streets. You might get asked to buy drugs, or solicited by a prostitute. But you'll almost certainly be safe if you politely decline, mind your business, and keep walking. Quiet side streets with no one on them may appear safe but, if something happens, you're on your own. There was a time I temporarily lived in an apartment complex in a place I wasn't familiar with. I went to the small gym area that was about a 5 minute walk from my apartment. When I got inside a man, maybe later 20s, was on a treadmill. Seemingly finishing with their workout cause he was standing on it on his phone, and I just felt odd. I am female and was 18 at the time. I was on an elliptical and about 5 minutes into my workout the man started walking on the treadmill. I dky but this made me really uncomfortable. I felt like he was going to try to do something or talk to me when I was done working out. So I thought about what I should do. I was on the elliptical right next to the door. So I lowkey grabbed my keys and my phone and I literally just hopped off the elliptical. I didn't even slow it down. And I started sprinting back to my apartment. I'm glad I did this because a few seconds after I bolted out the door. The man yelled hey wait after me. I had thought it through beforehand and I didn't leave anything behind. This was a new place so he couldn't have known me. There was just no reason for him to interact with me. I just had a really bad feeling about it. My advice is always trust your gut and be prepared to run. Stay out of debt. Eliminate it at top priority. Don't think interest rates are going to stay under 5 forever. Learn a lesson from the 80s. We could be going back there. Debt is paralyzing. Get out of it. Get the bank's hands out of your pocket. Then never go back. Don't pull out a knife if you don't have to, always make that your last resort. Also, if you're about to get in a fight, your best bet is to make your opponent think you're batshit insane. Look them in the eyes and scare the absolute crap out of them. Even if you can't avoid a physical fight it'll probably throw them off enough that you'll be able to get away with minor injuries. What is the best advice that one of your parents has given you? When I was bullied in school by one dickhead and school didn't do anything to stop it my dad said, punch that guy in the face as hard as you can. That should solve things and it did. My dad even came to the school and took me out from detention and when teachers tried to stop him he said, he did what you couldn't. He stopped a bully by himself I love my dad. My dad told me to ask politely, if that doesn't work, hit them as hard as you can. He promised to deal with the repercussions like your dad did. Grandpa always told me you don't always have to do what you love to love what you do. 
I took this to heart and switched from majoring in cello performance to computer engineering. Now I really like what I do at work and I love what I do with my free time. People are like glass. If one of them hurts you, they're probably broken. Mom. Sorry for any grammatical errors. A wise woman. Happy. Almost. Mother's Day. AJ Silvertongue's mom. It's in Chinese. But a translation would be, don't worry, if the sky falls down, use it as a blanket to help you sleep. Not my parents, but my 98 year old great grandmother told me yesterday that, to stay young, it's important to have a place to go to every week, especially as you get older. Don't give up what you want most for what you want now, shame it took me so long to listen to that advice. Sure, but I don't have a goddamn clue what I want. Don't spend more than you make, really it's all there is to not screwing up your life. If you've never had it bad you don't know when it's good, my mom told me those words when I first moved out and was struggling financially, they stick with me when times get tough. The taste of curdled milk does not change the taste of chocolate. When I began driving my father always said, assume everyone on the road is an idiot, and he was right. People often mistake being educated and having an opinion for having an educated opinion. It's the only reason Reddit thrives. Anger and worry are the two most pointless human emotions. Holding on to anger is like drinking poison and expecting the other person to die. Nobody sets out to be a villain. Nearly everybody thinks they're doing the right thing. It's just that two people can have different opinions on what the right thing is. Parents are drug dealers. Not to pull off on the side of highways or exit ramps. Instead, at very least continue onto the entrance ramp and pull over. This advice literally saved my life a few years ago. I was on I-70 and got off on a downward slopping exit to put on some warmer clothes. I pulled off on the gravel on the exit ramp and even shut the motorcycle off just before my dad's words rang in my head. I thought better of it, laughed at myself for even bothering and got back on the bike, pulled up crossed the intersecting road and up on the entrance ramp on the other side. As I was pulling out my leathers and rain gear two semi trucks came speeding down the ramp and the front truck had his brakes locked up in an effort to stop the other which must have lost his brakes. It was a mess and I would have been under those trucks without question. I called my dad that day and was in tears as I thanked him for drilling that advice in my head for years. Ah, semis, the motorcycle's natural predator. Let go said by my father. It was about a decade after his death that I realized how applicable this advice was to many things. Also, he told me to be gentle with yourself which I have also found useful years later. Conceal. Don't feel. When discussing physical relations, my mum didn't try to deter me from it or scare me away from it. She just told me to be confident that I was doing it with the right person, and to make sure that I wouldn't regret it. One of her favorite sayings is, I've never gone to bed with a dog, but I've sure woken up with one. Freaking wasn't taboo in my house and I was well informed from a young age which inevitably led to me making smarter decisions when I matured. When I told my mom I was going to stay a virgin until I got married, she rolled her eyes and said, yeah, right, at least she had the decency. Two years later, when I told her I had lost my virginity to not say, I told you so. My dad is a sociologist, and one of his early lessons in his class is everything depends on a lot. Things are complicated and interconnected and trying to make easy conclusions does it all a great disservice. I find this is great advice for life as well. I keep it in mind when people drive like jackasses or are rude. It's great when people accept the non-simplicity of life and think about things for a moment. It makes things a whole lot clearer and less frustrating in the end and all it took was a moment of thought. Some things will fall apart, in order for other things to fall into place. Thanks mom. Disaster Tetris. Only break one law at a time. Our exes are our exes for a reason. This is a comment I made the other day, and I inadvertently got this advice from my dad. But here goes. No matter what you're going through, life goes on and it doesn't stop. I'm 15, 
And this is what I have come to realize of my dad being hit by a boat in front of me and killed two days before Christmas. I had to open his presents the day after he dies. I had to go through his birthday. I am going to have to go through Father's Day. Life keeps moving. Whether you're there or not. So pick your head up kid. You might as well. I'm sorry for your loss. Hope for the best. Prepare for the worst. My dad told me that when I was preparing to move into state. Best advice I've ever gotten. Hey, I like this version better. Always expect the worst. Only then can you be pleasantly surprised. Too bad nobody remembers whose dad in particular said this. The greatest gift a man can give to his children is to show love to their mother. I'm pretty sure most people regret when they walk in on their parents. Even you have lot of money live like a middle class. This is when I remember that middle class means something completely different in the UK to the US. My dad always said every kid needs to spend at least one summer working at a really crappy job. There's nothing better than digging a hole in the sun or mopping crap off the floor to inspire you to earn a job with an air-conditioned office. Yep, nothing like wearing an ugly pirate uniform, serving fried fish, getting burned by hot grease splashes, coming home smelling like fried oil for minimum wage to make you start putting in college applications. My teenage job was like that old free credit report.com commercial in the restaurant. My dad has given me three awesome pieces of advice. Always have a story. Talk to new people. Chocolate is better than money. Always have a story. As a corollary, always take a risk that could result in a good story. Explore. You aren't here for very long. So, as a result, when a conversation lags you've got something interesting to jumpstart it again. Talk to new people. At first it sucks. Thankfully my dad started forcing me to do it as a child. Made me join the adult conversation. But that fear of social interaction is completely gone. Plus you seem like a fearless demigod when it comes time for public speaking. Chocolate is better than money. That is, giving someone in chocolate is far more memorable and carries more weight than cash alone. My dad grew up in a chocolate factory. People will be far nicer. Do more for you in the future if you tip them a box of chocolates. First day of class, box of chocolate for the teacher. First date, box of chocolate for the parents. TLDR, talk to people while doing things then give chocolate. You can outrun the cop, you can't outrun the radio. As a security guard that's like rule 3. Maybe not advice, but certainly life direction. My dad once told me protecting those weaker than you is the greatest thing a man can do. And it rhymes, that's excellent. Do it right, so you only have to do it once. That's along the lines of measure twice, cut once, sage advice. Everyone is just someone else's kid. Sometimes people pee you off or disappoint you, but it makes it easier to handle if you just remember that they're someone's kid. They have their own whole life of experiences and regrets behind them and they have their own problems. So maybe right now just isn't their best moment. Don't lift with your back. Lift with your brains. That's telekinesis, Kyle. I've got a bad case of baby face. I'm 26 now and still get carded at the occasional R-rated movie. A while back I was helping my parents out when some people stopped by to purchase a puppy that my parents were selling. Their son had a really demeaning attitude and was very condescending to me. After they left I started bitching to my stepfather about it and he told me some of the best advice I've ever heard. Joe, you can go through life assuming people are trying to be buttholes to you. Or you can chalk it up to someone being ignorant. In the end, the only real difference is that you're not left in a crappy mood once an ignorant person leaves, or something like that. Also, think of how great you're going to look in just a few short years when genetics kick in and all your friends around you start aging like old hags and you still look young and vivacious. Never never disrespect the baby face genetics, and always wear sunscreen to keep it that way. You are one of the lucky chosen few, my friend. I've never seen anyone successful who sleeps until 10. That was a huge wake up call for me. If children ever accuse you of being a peophile, whip out your flaxid dong to show them you are not aroused by their presence. Can not argue with the logic. Always be able to support yourself, not mine, but a friend's. Also, never date anyone you couldn't potentially marry, grandma. But freaking. 
If you're early, you're on time. If you're on time, you're late. I had never heard this before, so I thought I made it up myself. Thanks for proving me wrong. My version goes, there is no such thing as being on time. You are either early or you are late. Double quote. Lock the door during me time. Son, rich girls frick just as good as poor girls. My dad. I'm not really sure what he was getting at but whenever he said it he was really serious about it. Marry up. Finger her first, then go for a big hug. Smell your fingers behind her head. Then you know if you should go down or not. If it smells like fish, make it a dish. If it smells like provolone, leave it alone. They're just other people trying to get on with things. I tend to try and avoid strangers, particularly phoning up businesses or similar. But my mother was explaining that the person you are dealing with just wants to get it sorted and carry on with the rest of their day so they can get paid and spend time with their family. It's not the things you do in life that you regret, it's the things you don't do. You can take that statement a couple different ways but it's helped me make some scary business decisions that paid off. No risk no reward right dad? R.I.P. You miss all the shots you don't take. Elk coach feast, coach mass. If you nail ugly girls, you'll nail more girls, rough. Thanks Venezuelan dad. The man who fricks the uglies, F. Fricks the most. Edit. A word. My grandpa told me smile in front of your enemies. Don't show any signs of sadness, anger, weakness, and hatred in front of them. But on the inside keep that sadness, anger and hatred but don't show it. Sorry, it was hard translating Korean. English. Take all your feelings, and push them deep down where no one can get to them. Don't lie. Maintaining a lie will turn you into an old person. This is the point in your life where doors will start to close depending on how you act now. The more people you best the more doors remain open to you. That was advice given to me by my father about a month and a half before my exams. Really intelligent guy, but he never got any support in school for his dyslexia so he never got a higher education. I'm pleased to say that I'm now in a position where I'm, hopefully, going to be applying to medical school this year. Good for you. You're going to be a great doctor in the near future. Don't try and rush through school. Cause after that's done, you just have work ahead of you. Make sure you study what you enjoy. Remember the end goal of college is to get a job and support yourself. What's the best advice you can give someone starting college? Never buy your textbooks from the university bookstore. They are way overpriced and if they even buy them back you will get, at most, $3. Stick with renting or something like Chegg where you get the book for a quarter of the price and then you can just send it back when you're done. Also wait after the first day or week of classes to verify you'll need the textbook. Even email the professors before class. Or see if the book is in the library. It's better to try and do something 50% than to just not try. Don't let the fear of failure stop you from doing something. If you fall behind it's so easy to just let it consume you but you need to claw yourself out of that mindset inch by inch. This killed me my first time around in college. I would be late with one assignment and then just stop going to class because I was embarrassed. All I have to show for it is $15k in student loans and some crappy transcripts. Second time around went a lot better. If you don't understand something, speak up. You are not the only one with the same question. It's far more important to stay on track than to look cool in front of your peers. If you're intimidated by talking in class take advantage of your professor's office hours. Building that relationship and showing I was trying saved my butt a time or two. Use a calendar app to keep track of your classes. On the first day of class when you receive your syllabus go home that night and input all your important dates, tests, projects, etc. for each class. This is a really good one. Also use the same calendar to keep track of social events, me time, study time, etc. Block the time in your calendar, and try to stick to it. When someone invites you to a thing, and you can look at the calendar and see an empty spot, it's super easy to be able to say yes without hesitation, because you know that you have critical time booked already. Just because you got decent grades with very little effort in high school does not mean you can necessarily do the same in college. I did much better in college than in high school. 
I was actually taking classes that were interesting to me, instead of being forced into requirements that bored me to death. Take advantage of professor's office hours. When I was in college, I didn't want to be a needy pain in the ass so I didn't bother to get to know more than just one of my profs. My daughter just graduated college, and before the ceremony, we went to her school of business department brunch. I was shocked what a valued relationship she had with her profs. Lifelong friendship happening there. They love her and have sound advice that I could never provide to her. So use your resources. The last piece of advice I can give you is that you will make your best friends in college. Life will happen and you will lose touch a bit. Then more life happens and you will reconnect and continue to have the time of your lives together. Find a rhythm. Go to class. Find a library you can reliably go to and find a quiet spot to read or study. Get ahead of courses if you can. Sleep hygiene regularity is critical. Party in moderation. Save the zany stuff for the weekends. Be smart with your money. Above all, do not become a statistic and deeply regret flunking a course or squandering your time. There is absolutely nothing wrong with going to class, studying on weekdays, relaxing and having fun on weekends, and getting ample sleep. A rhythm can also be waking up 10 minutes before your class, not starting homework until 10pm, and going to sleep at 3am when you have to be awake by 8am. Find a healthy rhythm. Don't let yourself get sucked into an unhealthy cycle. Check your goddamn email. 1. Go to your classes. Skipping them to go drinking and partying won't help you. 2. Get into a schedule. We all know those people who have commitments of any type, at 9am, who don't even bother to go to sleep until 4am, then sleep through 5 alarms and end up being 2h late to everything. This won't work and you will frick yourself. 3. A big aspect of college university is the social aspect, not as big a portion of the learning part. Everyone wants to have a good time, but you aren't paying out the bus for the ability to go drink and party. You're paying out the butt to receive an education to help you in life. If you spend all your time drinking hungover instead of going to class, you're gonna have a bad time. 4. Don't wait 20 years to go. If you can help it, trust me, it sucks. Make sure your dorm is your safe haven. You'll always be able to find social events and parties, but you don't want that becoming the place where you sleep at night. Go to class. It's easy to fall in the habit because of the potential fun out of class activities. It's not high school. They aren't going to come figure out why you are missing class. You'll just fail out. I saw way too many smart people who just couldn't resist the party and late night life and failed out of school. You keep the debt and you have nothing to show for it. And when you go to class, actually pay attention in class. No reddit during lectures. Take advantage of summer internships in a field that you actually see a future in, rather than working ones that don't interest you on the merit of them paying more, if you can afford to do so. It can be really tough to break into certain lines of work after college, and a number of these bottom of the totem pole positions are only offered to current undergrads or very recent graduates. I can't emphasize enough how much a leg up you'll be giving yourself in life if you seek out these types of opportunities while you're still in school. I've seen other great advice here so here's something specific. Take notes in those lecture type classes. Preferably written and neat to the point someone else can read them writing things down helps you remember. If the professor already has a slideshow, great, you'll have your notes organized by that. Still copy the titles, all the bullets, and add the content he says out loud next to the point of the slideshow he said it at. Your notes will become a treasure you can share with any classmates you deem worthy studying with or simply worth saving. You might not want to study every day the week before a test and time budgeting might demand putting it off but I'd recommend reviewing these notes the two days nights before a test. Meet as many people as you can in the first two weeks of classes. Seriously, I'll never forget my dad explaining to me that there is a very unique two week window wherein everyone is ready to meet friends. People are more outgoing, excited, and are looking to establish their friend group. Put yourself out of your comfort zone for that period, create as many free opportunities as possible, and have fun. I would also add do not try to be someone you are not just to make friends. I tried this and ended up not keeping any of the friends I made in that two week window and found it very hard to make new friends. 
Don't use your loan money for fun stuff like new toys or buying drinks etc. Use what you need to survive. If there's extra, put it towards your debt. This is especially true for the gov loans. You can file bankruptcy for private ones but not the gov ones. Also don't do tons of drugs or drinking during the school week. It's easy to just want to blow things off, but it's your money and future you're wasting. Take fun classes but be aware of your core curriculum as well. I blew a lot of scholarship money at community college on courses I didn't take seriously. Some almost hurt my GPA. Try to have a goal, a major, and a career in mind. Counselors can tell you which classes are required. Don't drink and drive. Good luck out there. You're paying to be there. Act like it. There are lots of specific examples like go to class or have a career in mind but all of these stem from treating college like something you are paying for and not some requirement or obligation to someone else. I had a professor once who told us to divide out our tuition book CTC cost by the number of classes and to keep it in mind when skipping. Easy to say what's one class. Harder when you're thinking how you're paying $300 class and wasting it if not going. Totally random number there to disclaimer. Be smart with money. Enjoy the experience. Meet people. Study abroad if possible. But don't go to a Harvard Price school for a degree that is useless in the real world. I always see a lot of people saying stuff like the friends you make in college will last a lifetime and I can say from personal experience that it's not always true. My first two years of school, I spent most of my time with people who I wasn't that compatible with just to feel less lonely. I was too anxious to eat dinner alone every night and show up to parties alone. So I stuck it out with toxic, boring friends just for the company. We had some good times together. But after transferring schools I really felt no need to ever contact them again. It's okay to just be passing through. If you get your degree and continue doing the things you love then you've succeeded. The 4ish years that you'll spend in school are not dissimilar to the other 80 that you'll spend out of there. Sure, you're surrounded by an ideal setup of people in your age group that are also looking to meet people. But sometimes things don't work out perfectly. And from what I can tell. Your life at home is pretty much gonna play out the same in school. College was a time to become myself away from my parents, but it certainly didn't resemble what I thought it was gonna look like. Sure there were parties, but they were often boring, leaving me to go back to my room alone and wake up nauseous and need to go study for the rest of Sunday. It's fine if it doesn't look like the movies you watched. College doesn't have to be the time that you meet your best man. Sleep with everyone. Find your future spouse and do all the drugs. If you make these huge expectations, you'll probably be disappointed. Instead, the things I remember were more along the lines of going outdoor art climbing for the first time, making edibles, having fun dicking around with my lab partners, or hearing a good speaker series talk. Oh also, don't be afraid to transfer. I was miserable at my first school and leaving made all the difference. Don't think that you have to stick it through just because you picked it the first time. Sage advice this, and the only worthy comment in the entire thread. Don't skip class. Once you start, you don't stop. Don't schedule any 8am classes unless you know dang well you're a morning person. Managing to get in high school doesn't count. Eat well. It's easy to develop bad eating habits that just make you feel crappy. It's better to turn in a project or assignment late and well rather than incomplete and on time or even not at all. Make good relationships with professors. It helps. I can't stress this enough. I tell all of the kids from work who are going off to college in the fall. There's going to be this voice that says, take the 8am class. That way you'll be done with your day earlier. That voice is the devil speaking. Don't listen to it. Save waking up at 6.30 or 7 o'clock in the morning until you know you can do it without anyone to nag you. <laughs> Treat college like a job instead of a 4 year party. Knuckle down. Commit yourself to working at least 35 hours every week. Otherwise you're just being a time thief against your future. Nobody goes to university to make enemies. First years are so desperate to make friends that even a socially maladjusted personality deficient loser can make friends effortlessly just by walking up to people and introducing themselves. Don't buy the books until a week after school. Most professors never use them and if they do they just go over it in class during lecture. Just go to class and take notes. Unless it's math. Can't do the HW unless you know what CH. 
5 question 12 AFR. My advice is more for engineering and other STEM students as we have a drastically different education and workload than others. If you feel like you're not smart enough you're in the right place. You'll always feel like an educational outcast until your intro classes are half empty and you made the cut. Those who think they're hot crap don't study and have a rude awakening when they realize that they can't just breeze through STEM courses with little effort. Continuing on that, don't feel like you need to study in the remaining summer days or feel like you immediately have to be on top of things. Intro courses are specifically designed for someone who has zero knowledge in that topic. Generally, the first week or two will even go over basic concepts to contextualize what you're about to learn. Understand that certain aspects of your life are going to change dramatically. Your social life is going to shrink significantly regarding anyone who isn't your peer. You may feel the need to quit any part-time jobs or other activities if able, and your sleep schedule is going to feel somewhat non-existent. Overall, you're going to be mentally and emotionally exhausted, cornered, and feel like any minute you're not studying or doing work is another minute you're being left behind. Remember that everyone feels this way and pretty much everyone had a meltdown at one point during their engineering degree. Can't say so much for others. Just keep in mind that everyone needs breaks. Whether that's playing video games for a few hours or occasionally hanging out with friends for the day, you'll probably feel guilty during them, but you'll learn to relax. After about a year or two and when you have all the crappy brute force work prereqs completed and learned to adapt, things will get a lot better. $70k plus salaries right out of college is also a nice light in the tunnel. Comma if you feel like you're not smart enough you're in the right place. You'll always feel like an educational outcast until your intro classes are half empty and you made the cut. Even though I'm way beyond the intro courses, I still don't feel smart enough for mayo. Get a warm blanket, get a fan heater or similar, get meals you can have in your dorm. For example ramen, or if you got a freezer and way of boiling stuff. Things like gyoza, or even just a lot of dried pasta and some ready-made sauces pesto. It sounds a bit preparation but at uni I've been without heat 4 stroke 5 times, and it can be really miserable. Similarly there's been a few nights where I've got hungry and had no food, and there's not been shops open. It can be pretty depressing. Also don't forget to bring things you enjoy. If you play guitar bring it, and don't be afraid of joining societies that are weird nerdy. If you've always played chess, keep playing join the society don't stop cause you want to reinvent yourself. Frick reinventing yourself, you'll evolve naturally at uni so don't force it. I don't really like the person I've evolved into since college. Sometimes I go back and read my memes and texts from high school and I seemed cooler than lol. Always do your work. Saw so many people fail out because they didn't complete their assignments. You spend too much money not to be turning in something at least. Condoms are cheaper than diapers also if you a dude consent 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 don't even let there be a possibility of misunderstanding. Condoms are cheaper than diapers also if you a dude consent 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 don't even let there be a possibility of misunderstanding. FTFY, it goes both ways, not pointing any fingers, just saying. 1. Ask yourself if you are ready and mature enough for college. There is no shame in taking a gap year to figure some stuff out. 2. From a social perspective, befriend good people who will support you in positive ways. Be careful who your friends influences are and avoid selfish toxic people. Don't get lost in the freedom and drinking. When you are drinking be very aware of your drink and your level of intoxication. There are always sharks. Avoid the hard drugs. 3. From an academic perspective. Develop relationships with your teachers and responsible grading parties. TA grad students. I never turned in assignments on time. Not something to be proud of but because I had strong relationships and always turned in quality work. They let it slide. Go to class. No one gives a crap about your degree without work experience. Find internships every summer or get a job with relevant experience. Oftentimes these internships turn into job offers if you play it right. Summer isn't about partying and being lazy. My academic year was my vacation and my summers were spent working extra shifts in the industrial world. 4. Many young guns don't understand the financial burden of college and that many people will never get a second chance to return should you frick it up. 
Once that first loan bill comes you sure better hope you're not making $10 HR with a useless degree. I highly recommend a year or two of community college with a plan to transfer. Make sure these credits transfer ahead of time. You will be at a huge disadvantage if you're swimming in debt after graduation. I promise, if you take what I have wrote here to heart, you will be happy and successful during your academic career. These are the best but hardest years of your life. Unfortunately, all of this will be lost to some of you. There are winners and losers in the world. Be a winner. Only the strong advance. If you do take a gap year, do something with it. Don't use it as an extended summer vacation. Actually go out. Find a job doing something weird, go to a new city, volunteer overseas long term, join Habitat for Humanity. Never buy textbooks just because they are listed for the class. Wait until syllabus day and try to figure out if you actually will need a book or not. I definitely had a few classes that said books were required, but were doable with just lecture notes and very rarely trips to the library. Also do as many internships as possible, that experience is probably the most important part of your resume. Go to class, you're paying for it. It's easier to maintain an A, than try and increase your grade as the semester moves in. Score great on early homework, quiz, tests and assignments. Always 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 apply to internships. Take advantage of reduced cost services like software, like Microsoft Office, etc. Go to class. This is the easiest way to contribute to your grade. Just show up. Even if you don't wanna do anything that day, just show up and at least get those attendance points. Do your assignments early, not late. You do not wanna fall behind and have a backlog of projects to do. Here's my advice for this. When class ends, Go to the library or somewhere and do all of your work. Do this, and then go home. Do not do your work at home your dorm. This way, you can make sure work stays at college, and relaxing stays at your dorm. This is a preference, but this worked well for me. Learn to be organized. Make folders for each of your classes on your desktop. Have a notebook divided into sections and keep one section for each class. Know where all of your projects are and never delete them. Save all of your crap to a cloud, OneDrive, or something. This saved my life once when my laptop froze during a Windows update and completely bricked. I had to wipe it and give it a fresh install of Windows. If I hadn't saved my paper to the cloud, I would have had to rewrite an 11 page report in one night. Don't waste your money. Save what you can. Eat cheap. Eat healthy. It's very easy to go out to eat 3 times a day but that's expensive and bad for you. Buy chicken, rice, seasonings, and some other essentials and learn to cook. Your stomach, body, wallet, and perhaps even future so will love you for your cooking skills. Use your resources. Your college has entire staff members whose entire job is to help you be a good student. Utilize this. Ask for help. As you approach milestones in your career, ask your professors if they know of job prospects in your field. With proper networking, you can find a job before you even graduate. That's what I did and my student loan payments are thanking me for it every month. It's scary, but you got a plan for post college. Be aware of where you are gonna live, what you will be doing, and how you will pay for it all. Make acquaintances in every class. At least get on first name basis with a few people in every class. This is for two reasons. 1. Socializing is a fun part of college. You're gonna make friends, meet new people from different walks of life, and learn a lot from them and vice versa. Even if you're introverted, this social experience is going to have a good impact on you. 2. This way, you have someone to reach out for in each class when you need help or clarification. Just someone who you can text after hours and be like yo, what assignment did Professor Farnsworth want us to do for next week? Lastly, don't let the stress get to you. It seems like a lot, but if you take it bit by bit and learn how to budget your time, you'll find plenty of time to relax. This is why my second point is so important. If you get your assignments done early, you don't have to stress about them and you get to relax. Relaxing is important. If a class doesn't take attendance and you find yourself needing a break, don't go. Get the notes online or from a friend. This is always said on Reddit and is ridiculous. Going to every class isn't necessary. During my MBA program, I skipped a few every now and then and was fine. Take the time to rest, do other homework or socialize. 
time management is huge. Dedicate time to study, sleep, eating, and leisure. Work as well, if necessary. Use a calendar. Color coordinate daily events. Check the calendar every day and throughout the day. Develop a habit of being proactive towards your goals. Setting goals is severely underrated. Have short-term, mid-term and long-term goals. Short-term goals could be for the semester, getting straight A's, attending all your classes, spending only a certain amount of money. Mid-term goals could be for the school year, maintaining a certain GPA, being recognized for an academic award, getting an internship, etc. Long-term goals could be where you want or need to be upon graduation. Setting goals and following through with them will always set you up for success. Don't sacrifice your mental or physical well-being. Go to the gym, go for a hike, enjoy a picnic, stay in touch with family and friends. Drugs, sex and parties may seem like fun but they can seriously erode your physical and mental health which can translate to a poor academic return. Study abroad if you can. Try to stay away from student loans. Engage with the professors whether you're stumped on a topic or not. Go to class and be involved in the learning of the subject. Sit up front. Take handwritten notes instead of using your computer. Have fun, but do what you're there to do. To learn and better prepare yourself for the adult world. Source. I was an academic coach during my senior year and spent many hours helping struggling students find their footing. If you are new to the channel, you can subscribe. I publish new videos every day. Until then, check another video. Bye for now.